What's up, fight fans? Luke Thomas here. It's, uh, I really don't even know what the date is. It's Monday at some point. Uh, welcome to the Monday Morning Analyst. I'm so behind on this project that it's not even funny. A lot of you are asking, where is part two of the UFC 200 stuff? It's so big, I'm actually still working on it, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, so what I wanted to do is I didn't want to miss today, but so today I'm just going to do on Wednesdays and Saturdays fights. But I'm going to save the UFC 200 stuff for a big extravaganza. I suspect by the time it comes out, you'll have lost interest. But I don't know how to do it without making it big. So, there we are. Anyway, let's move on to today's stuff while we still have some time. Two fight cards to look at. There was a UFC card and a Bellator card that I kind of want to focus in on. UFC Fight Night 91 and Bellator 158. So let's go with the big one first, or the bigger one of the two anyway. Um, the last fight card, or the fourth fight card in seven days for the UFC, and in terms of entertainment... Maybe the best one. Uh, didn't quite have, you know, the the rich drama or even necessarily all the super high level stuff you saw in, you know, Claudia versus Joanna or, um, you know, pick what are the other ones that there were for the other three fight cards. But it definitely had a lot to enjoy. So it was it was uh, at the UFC's debut in South Dakota. This was at the Denny Sanford Premier Center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The attendance quite modest. 5,617 for a gate of $381,945. Your bonus winners, Tony Ferguson versus Lando Venata, which of course we'll get to in just a second. And performance of the night, two of them, one went to Louis Smolka. We'll look at his fight in detail. And then John Lineker as well. They all got 50000 each. So, John Lineker taking on Michael McDonald, who won at 243 of the first round. John Lineker, what do you want to say about this guy? Um, does it mind the reach disadvantage? At bantamweight, you know, if you're punching here and you're punching kind of straight, it's not as taxing if you're doing that or down. As you punch up, it's a little more taxing. Doesn't seem to bother him at all because he doesn't have to do it for very long. You know, once he lands, they just kind of all go away. Here's what stood out to me in this fight. It was not merely its violence. You know, Michael McDonald cracked him a bunch. You saw Lineker's head whip a number of times from big punches that McDonald landed. McDonald, like to his credit stood in the pocket with him and traded and traded and traded. And he got his licks in. And I think McDonald thought, you know, I'm the, I'm the straighter puncher, and I may be the more accurate puncher of the two. If I can just sneak in a couple of those, like most people. Remember, McDonald is known for being a heavy puncher himself. Um, this will either slow down or stop Lineker, and it did neither. What terrifies me about Lineker is not merely his punching power, which is the most vaunted thing about him, but really his chin might be equally good. He can get in there and just bomb on guys because even if they stick him in short range, it's never really enough. Uh, Lineker is a ferocious, ferocious talent and looks really good at bantamweight. Uh, Tony Ferguson taking on Lando Venata. He wins by Darsh took at 222 of the second round. First round might be round of the year. Just an absolute back and forth. Tony Ferguson getting head kicked and finding a way to stick it out. Lando Venata taking his own licks, getting blended up. Now, eventually, by the second round, uh, the jab started really working for Tony Ferguson, popping him in range, uh, and then ultimately, you know, securing the dark stroke in a way where he could put him away. But that first round was incredible. Lando Venata coming in on super short notice, a Jackson Wink guy, and giving Tony Ferguson everything he could handle. This is why tune-up fights are important. Not that this this wasn't exactly a tune-up fight in the planned way, but I mean, everyone's like, geez, Habib Nurmagomedov didn't look that good after two years. Uh, on a short notice opponent after two years, you got to be very, very careful what the kind of things you, you do are. And you saw John Jones, and forget all his recent troubles, but you saw him against OSP, didn't look all that good necessarily. Um, it's hard to look good one time off, and it's hard to look good on short notice against the guy you haven't trained for. So um, Tony Ferguson gutting it out the way he did, and Lando Venata gutting it out the way he did. Um, credit to both gentlemen. Salute to both of you guys. Tim Boach defeating Josh Saman. TKO punches, 349 of the second round. Look, everyone in the MMA media has a super super soft spot for Josh Saman, me especially, right? Um, because he works at one of our SB Nation sister sites. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I got, I got phlegm in my nose. Um, you know, he's got a physique like there's no tomorrow. He's an incredible guy. But I, after that fight with, uh, who was the last fight he had? The, the, the barn cat fight, uh, the tandem record fight. I was like, he, he's a little bit wild. Um, and maybe guys who are really good at controlling people on the floor could have, not their way with him, but maybe create some trouble for him. And sure enough, that was the, the, the situation here was Tim Boach is just too strong. And I mean, again, I haven't spoken to Josh. I don't know exactly what his plan was, but it didn't look to me necessarily like locking up with Tim Boach in a proactive way um, was the best approach to this fight. <clears throat> Daniel Milanchuk 
and Alexei Olenek had the worst fight ever, and it was a decision a majority for uh, Daniel Omelanchuk. 28-28, 29-28, 29-28, 28, worst fight ever. Uh, Kaita Nakamura defeated Kyle Noak via rear naked choke at 1-459 of the second round. You know, no, two veterans here, so, you know, both guys can do interesting things. Noak looked good kind of early, had some good takedowns, but Nakamura just kind of stayed in his face until he found openings for his punches. Uh, Louis Smolka defeated Ben Wynn at 441 of the second round. We'll look at that in the second segment. Uh, preliminary card, Fox Sports 1. Caitlin, uh, oh, her name is tough, tough to pronounce. Chukagian defeated Lauren Murphy, unanimous decision, 29-28, which sounds about right to me. She won the first and the third. Second round, she got controlled and taken down. So here's what I would say about Chukagian, a well-schooled fighter. Disciplined shots, always on the move, always on her feet, always cutting angles, always doing the things necessary to really um, keep the fight on her terms. I was very impressed by that. Lauren Murphy just trying to find a way in, trying to bulldoze her way in, and, and certainly had some success in that second round, but just the distance and the jab of Chukagian was a little bit too tough for Lauren Murphy to manage, but you know both fighters looked really good in the end. Uh, Sam Alvey defeating Eric Spicely, Spicely guillotine choke 243 in the first round. This was a donk fest. This is the one that kind of interested me. Courtney Casey defeating Christian, uh, Christina Stanchu at 236 in the first round. Courtney Casey had come to the UFC. I saw some of her fights, I think, in RFA or Legacy. I forget which where she fought. And I remember being immediately impressed by her. And then she came to the UFC and had some rough starts. You know, she had her moments here and there, but could never really get things going. She looked awesome in this one. She had great throws in this one, really doing them, uh, timing them perfectly, timing mount off of them perfectly, timing offense off of them perfectly. Uh, perfect distancing she was finding for her own positioning and balance for ground and pound, and never never gave Stanchu, who can be tough in her own right at distance, uh, that kind of space. Really happy to see Courtney Casey get things going. I, have, I, I think very highly of her game, and I was glad to see her notch that UFC win. Uh, Scott Holtzman defeating Cody Fister, 30-27, 30-27, 29-28. Fister did better defensively uh, early on than I thought he was going to. Holtzman looks the part, man. The guy looks like a physical beast, but can't quite push it into second gear sometimes, or I should say third gear, but obviously did enough in this particular case. Uh, Hani Yaya defeating Matthew Lopez, arm triangle choke. Hani Yaya is a, I mean, what do you want to say about him? The, guys are, the guy is one of the few guys who can do a nogi lat north-south choke because he's just ridiculous. Uh, and then Alex Nicholson, seemingly from the brink of defeat, defeating Devin Clark uh, via punches at 457 of the first round. Really good job there. Uh, fighter of that card, I'm going to give to Louis Smolka. Um, and you'll see why in the second segment. So let's quickly talk about uh, Bellator 158, Daily versus Lima. This took place at the O2 Arena. I do not know if I have any numbers on... Let's see if I have any numbers I can give you guys on attendance and such. It did not look very full from what I was looking at on TV, but I suppose it's possible. Um, total gate was 1.1, basically $1.2 million, 1,155,181 US dollars, 875,000 pounds. Attendance, 12,300. This is at the O2 Arena. UFC's, or I should say, Bell Tours debut in London. Um, I'm not even going to get to the uh, prelim card, doesn't matter, but. Um, Douglas Lima taking on Paul Daly. So all the favorites won on this one. I picked all the favorites, of course, and they all did. They all won. Um, my thought on Paul Daly was that I didn't know that he was going to essentially be outstruck by Douglas Lima. What I thought Lima was going to do was jab, get in close, and eventually get takedowns and right on top. He's actually a really underrated wrestler and has good top control. And you did see some of that. But what you also saw was that Lima was just quicker to the punch. Uh, more accurate, um, was backing Daly up. Daly had a moment early in the middle of the second round, but then he got rocked. Uh, the combination punching of Lima really gave him some problems. Matt Mitrion defeating Ole Thompson, 421 of the second round. Matt Mitrion is just bulldozing these guys and making money, and God bless him. I don't know how much he's training for these, because he's not really fighting like himself. He's fighting in a very, what do you want to call it? Not that he's not entertaining. Matt Mitrion is entertaining. Um, but he's fighting in a very entertainment first kind of way. Like, I don't know that I'm watching this and I'm seeing the best of him. I mean, he's certainly showing how tough he is and how good he is, but is this like the most elite version of him? No, I don't think so. Now, I'm not saying anything's wrong with him. I guess what I'm just wondering is, you know, now that he's in belts or is he feeling like no matter what I do, I can't lose. Francis Karma defeated Lucas Klinger, Darce Choke, 354 in the first round. This was an interesting one. The Darce Choke is kind of... In, 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 my view of the Darce, and this is not going to be the way to get it every time, but my view of the Darce is that unless you can rest your body on top of the free arm, so remember, it's a head and it's an arm. 
And when you lock it up, you often see guys, and you saw Klinger do this. They put their hands up and they push out. Because what they want to do is they want to push on your hip to create a little bit of separation. What I always try to do is I always try to put my body weight on top of that arm. I'm on top. If their arm is here, if they're getting choked here and their arm is here, putting your body weight over the top of that. And you didn't see Carmon be able to do that. Klinger was kind of able to push him off, as I just showed before. So what did he do? He kind of rolled to his back a little bit to bring him in and then wrapped it up tight and then used that to sit to uh, like mount. So he almost pulled guard, not all the way, to then sit to mount. And when he sat to mount, that's when he was able to crunch in all the weight on top. But w Tony Ferguson can finish without putting his body on top of the arm because he's just really good at the darts. I'm not saying you have to do that. But just sort of watch how often guys try it and let it go because they don't get their body weight on top of that outside arm. Um, Michael Page defeating Ange Ange uh, Evangelista Santos. Holy Jesus. Uh, KO flying knee. 431 of the second round. He got taken down in the first round, which sort of needs to be noted. It's kind of a forgotten story of this fight. What do you want to say about that KO? There are... The whole premise of MMA is that, yes, it's dangerous, and yes, bad things can happen, but with proper regulation and oversight and with screening, right, like not any person can just walk into the cage, like... You have to have you licensed and have you an established fighter and you have to earn your way to the top and that kind of thing. That basically what happens is the injuries are, are more or less knowable. Like we don't, we see bad injuries, we do see broken bones, but we don't see guys getting their skulls crushed, right? If, if this were happening routinely where guys were getting their skulls crushed, we would have to ask questions about how ethical this is. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, if one bone can break, why can't the other? I don't know that all bones are as equally hard. I mean, in fact, I'm quite sure that they're not, but... Um, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I've never seen a guy's, I mean, maybe I have and I don't remember, but that is that is definitely one of those injuries where you're like, are, is what we're looking at okay? Um, I, I still think the answer is yes, because I think this is a rare thing. But if you didn't have that reaction, you might be a sociopath, um, because that was shocking. That was super, super shocking. Um, I don't really know what's left of his career at this point. I don't know what the medical prognosis would be. Um, but yikes, that was, and the sound it made, oh God, I'm not trying to play it here on the podcast. Uh, it was, it was nasty. Uh, and then James Gallagher, a top prospect defeated Mike Cutting, unanimous decision, essentially just sort of was all over from the grappling context, um, from pillar to post, right? So, um, not a whole lot to say about that there. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Let's take a look at Smolka versus Ben Wynn, which was just an awesome fight. Um, so much happened. It was so good. I think I have more than a hundred slides for just a round and some change. Well, essentially two rounds of action, a little bit less than two rounds of action. Still, that's a lot of slides because there's so much that happened, so much cool stuff. And the truth is I came out of this fight being like more appreciative of both guys. Ben Wynn did a lot of cool defensive things and showed some fundamentals that are, that show me he's going to be awesome down the line. And Louis Smoka, man, I, I, I don't think he would beat Demetrius Johnson. I'm not saying that. But this is the first time in a while where I've seen a flyweight contender push through, and I'm like, you know what? That fight might be kind of fun. You know, I definitely would favor Demetrius, don't get me wrong. But how many times does somebody get a flyweight title shot, and you're just like, eh, he, was, he, he, he fought on Facebook. This is not one of those kinds of guys. This kind of guy can fight his ass off, and you're going to see why. So let's take a look now. Smolka versus Wynn. All right, so let's look at Ben Wynn taking on Luis. I keep calling him Luis Smolka. It's actually pronounced Luis Smolka. Um... Here's what I want you to pay attention to when we look at this. A lot of people are like, wow, um, you know, Smoka's transitions are great. And that's true, they are. Uh, wow, um, you know, he'll go with you. No, let me take a step back. They talk about his transitions. They talk about his escapes. Um, and those are good, too. Um, and they talk about his ability to just sort of be fluid in position. And, and, and all those things are true. Like, none of those things are an incorrect assessment of his game. But they miss a central feature to it that was really prominent in this one, which is, yes, he can escape. Yes, he can scramble. He can do all those things. But the truth is, he does those things to bring the fight back basically to a small series of common scenarios. Right? It's not true that he is just escaping and rolling and going with the flow and letting you dictate or he'll come up with a position this time and come up with a position next time. Not really. He likes to get back to bread and butter positions. Now he does some orthodox things to get there, um, and you know he can't always keep the fight there. But that's really what he's doing. He's trying to get the fight back to this set of scenarios where he really operates well, and from there he gets you to pick your poison. 
So when you think about Luis, God damn it, when you think about Luis Smolka, yes, appreciate all the crazy things he can do, but really think about how he likes to do that to bring the game back to his neck of the woods. Okay, with that being said, here we are. Ten seconds in, these two got right to work. And I actually think it was Ben Wynn who was tearing him up on the feet just a little bit uh, and then got Smolka to sort of uh, reach for a takedown here. You can see um, Ben Wynn does a pretty good job of getting his elbow just inside here, the forearm just inside on the clavicle of uh, Smolka here to prevent him getting you know double unders right away. And so they're going to turn in a circle. And what you're going to see is a very common thing where... And you'll see this later. So he's got over-under positions, 50-50. But the better position here is Smolka looks like he's got his shoulders more set up a little bit, kind of. Um, but And his feet a little more planted. But I like the angle that uh, Ben Wynn has here. It's just a little bit on the outside. Doesn't really give... I mean, if he was explosive, he could throw him this way. You know, he could throw him over his hip. He could, he could fit in. He could put this foot back here, bring his foot around, and then throw him over. But... They're still moving in a circle at this point. So I actually kind of like what Wynn's doing. Wynn's kind of coming around counterclockwise. So you see that. Now look here. You can see Smolka is the one doing the throwing motion here. And this throw doesn't work. Now why doesn't it work? Well, you know, without having the ability to feel it or see it in a different angle, it's hard to say exactly. But here's my sense of things. You've got one guy bent over and he's wrapping around the head, but he hasn't really... Number one, his hips are a little high, Smolka's. He hasn't really loaded win onto his hips. you got to get someone on your hips, and you got to lift them off the ground with your hips as you, you get down underneath them, and then you sort of raise up and explode through, right? He hasn't really loaded him. And also, he's broken his posture a little bit. I mean, that's not erect posture, but it's not, he's not, again, he's not loaded, and he's not pulling him over his back or pulling him over his hip. He's kind of leaning forward, and then... But he's not, he's not, he hasn't put a uh, win in a position where he's going to get turned or thrown or, you know, just anything. He just hasn't gotten up underneath him, I guess, is the, is the best way to say this. And you'll see that because they land face first, right? If you had loaded him up on the hips, he would have gone with you, uh, and he didn't. So this is how they land. Um, now, you'll notice that this is a, this is getting back to originally what we're talking about with Smolka. This is one of the things that makes him so special because he can get in these really bad compromising positions and it doesn't really rattle him because he has a lot of answers. Now, what I found out watching this fight was he has more answers to the different scenarios than I thought he did. And the answers all look kind of similar. So I'll show you what I mean. So this puts Smoke in a real bad spot. And what does Ben Wynn do? Ben Wynn's going to immediately... He, he's getting held onto here, but you know, Smoke knows there's nothing here. He may be doing this just so he can get to some kind of halfway position holding the neck and the head like this. But he's going to let that go. Wynn is going to get this right hand underneath, and he's going to come to leg drag. Leg drag is a great position where essentially you get someone to lay on their side, but if you're doing leg, jack, leg, leg drag correctly, you kind of want them to be um, flat on their shoulders. So your hips are going one way, shoulders going another, and there's a lot of passes you can get from there. Um, but the best part about leg drag is you can it's easy to move to mount, and if you don't want to move to mount, if the person tries to like extend out of it, you immediately move to side control. So imagine moving from side control into sort of facing them, and you just scooped uh, their top leg and moved on top of their bottom leg. It's sort of a way to describe leg drag. This is leg drag, right? He's over the bottom leg. He's being blocked by the top one. That's leg drag. And there's a ton of passes from there. But you want to move to mount, right? Like, you got someone here. This is what you want to do. So you can see with leg drag, in an, especially with the gi, in like in, in, in gi jiu-jitsu, you can use this to like push it down straight and you can pass. So what Ben Wynn is going to do is he's going to, as he stays, this one's already stepped over, he's going to step his right leg over the bottom leg of Smolka. And he's going to extend that top one even further out. Check this out. Look at that, huh? Now look how Smolka is twisted here. This is the bottom foot of Smolka, if you can believe it. It's like a crazy way for him to be this way, but... In other words, what he's doing here, as you can see, his spine is kind of telling you what the story is here. He's getting stretched because Wynn has this underhook, and he's uh, pushing that top leg super far out. But while the shoulder is kind of down, it's not fully planted. In other words, Smoke is not surrendering to his shoulders. He's not letting himself get stretched in a way that Wynn wants to stretch him all the way. Uh, he's at least putting up some kind of resistance. Now, it's not very stern resistance, but it's resistance none the same. So, what does Ben Wynn do? He's going to push down on this one. He's going to step over. This is not quite the most technical way to do it, but it will work. And what happens when he steps over? 
You guys can kind of figure this out. This is sort of a leg weave pass, right? Very simply, he's going to slide to mount. You can see that pretty, pretty clearly, right? So there's nothing blocking the right leg. Once the right leg steps around and the left leg comes over, you just you just slide right into mount, basically. Um, he would want this. Most people start with this one on the outside a little bit. They don't start with it inside necessarily, although you can do that too. Um, actually, that's not true. You can start with it here too. Um, but obviously clearing that top leg is the most critical part of this uh, leg weave pass. This is the pass that Conor McGregor used on Dennis Seaver. There's actually a couple of leg weave passes in this uh, whole card, um, which tells you a lot about how cool the jiu-jitsu was. All right, so he moves to mount. So Ben Wynn's doing pretty good here. We're just 30 seconds into this fight, by the way. It feels like an eternity already. Um, okay, so this is the common thing that I noticed Smolka does. So Smolka does something here very, very risky. Now, against the fence, it doesn't matter too much. So he's going to roll. And when he's going to roll, he's going to roll, I guess, to his He's going to roll to his right. He's gonna, always going to leave an arm hanging. Now, in modern jiu-jitsu, if there's no fence, now the fence here kind of blocks it, but let's say it was in the middle of the cage. The guy underneath, like a Ryan Hall type, they're going to triangle you fast, super fast doing this. If you plant on one hand and you leave a hand hanging out, you saw what uh, Ronda Rousey did to Kat Zingano. Like, she did that sitting sort of side arm bar. If you do this to someone else um, like that, someone who's really quick with guard or arm bar or arm and head chokes with their bodies, with their, not, 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 in other words, not merely guys who go for head and arm triangles, but guys who can do triangles, guys who can do arm bars from the guard, that kind of thing. Uh, you're going to get torn to pieces doing this. But I guess Ben wins. You know, again, in this particular case, he's against the fence, so he can't really turn. And here's what I think Smolka is doing. Um, I had to watch this a few times. Number one, he's getting to his base because that's the best place you want to be, right? And I think he, he's having to go a number of different directions. He is trying to use this wizard to force wins head down break his posture and he wants to get his weight up under him stand and turn and face into him in other words sort of come out um um how would he how would he rotate here he would get he would get essentially wind to slide up underneath all right what does he do he brings that right foot up he's still driving his weight down you can see wind is posting because he doesn't want to go any further up he's going to slide off this is real. This is a real dangerous thing to do. Again, against the fence, this is a great thing to do. In the middle of open space, you have to be very careful about it, right? All right. So then he gets both knees under him, still driving that weight down. Look how the broken posture is here of Ben Wynn. And then he's going to stand. And as he stands, this is going to come a little bit loose. You're going to watch him switch from over the shoulder to around the waist. And when he goes around the waist, he stands with that left foot at the same time. He makes a break for it super fast. So that's an interesting thing he does. Now, when he does it, real quickly, I want you to note one thing, and we'll go back. I want you to note how he tries to bring this side of his body as close to the elbow as he can. In other words, he doesn't go straight back. He gets at an angle. You'll see that. See how he brings that right knee first? He's coming at an angle, this inside angle here. In, in, steps through. Right? And then he kind of squares up once he steps through. Right, which is fine, actually. Almost better to, uh, to do that, depending on what you want to do. And then they stand. So a really great job by Luis Smoke. A dangerous way to do that in open space, but against that fence, you know, um, there's not a whole lot of guys going to be able to do to get to swing underneath for an arm. So then they stand, and what does he do? He does, They, by the way, they turn and erect. You can go back and look here. See how they're facing the fence? They're going to come out and around. This is how, often how you get the best takedowns. You get them in motion in a direction. Right? They're not merely just moving, but they're moving in a, in a circle. Because it's just hard to stop your, your momentum. It's hard, if, especially if there's a blocking mechanism. It's just an easy way. You know, a blast double straight back, that works if you have an incredible blast double. But most doubles are shoot in, grab, and then cut at an angle. Because it's your body can go sort of backwards and forwards. Side to side, it doesn't have a lot of stability. So, it takes them at an angle to the side. And they go down right into side control. This is a uh, common position for Luis Smoko. Now, even if this was in half guard, it'd be common. In other words, he likes to operate here, or with one leg, he'll let you have half guard. And from there, he'll just light you on fire. This is what I'm talking about when I say he, when he, he'll make you pick your poison. He'll, he'll threaten passes. He does it with ground and pound. He has long arms. He's able to reach you from far distances. So even if you're like getting defensive guard positions, which you'll see Ben Wynn do a lot of, uh, it doesn't really matter. He can bang on you. And to the extent you get to your base... Uh, and you try to leave with a high head and scrambles, he makes you pay for it, All right? So here's what we're going. We're still in the first minute. Oh, there's an Omoplata scramble uh, in between here and then. It's not all that great, but this is what I want to show you. This is pretty cool by Ben Wynn. 
Ben Wynn is really good about using his shins to lift. Um, you'll see him do that here in half guard with the underhook. And you'll see him do that at like deep half later on in the fight. Like he's and actually there's other scenarios where he uses it as well. Ben Ben Wynn is real good in jujitsu if he's on his back. A he's always working for defensive guard positions. I'm going from half guard to half guard knee shield, half guard knee shield to full guard, full guard. You know maybe he likes butterfly guard for sweeps. I don't know, but he's he's always using his guard for something, and he's really good about using not just an underhook to stand, but an underhook and then his butterfly hooks to get you elevated, to get space, to get things going. So you can see he's got the underhook here, and he's going to elevate with this left inside butterfly hook. He's probably going to try and come around the corner, right? That's typically what's going to happen. Although, depending, we'll see how things go here, right? Brings him inside. Luis Smolka tries to step down to kill that hook. He's still got the underhook, though, right? So then he kind of tries to sit up the opposite way. Now, this is a bit of a weird transition. How much time elapsed? Yeah, just one second. So I guess Smolka did this. He must have extended out and sat up. And you can see what Smolka already trying to do. I'm going to go for that. Uh, choke. Now, interesting part about Smolka's choke, he can do it from either arm apparently quite easily. That's a dangerous guy. A lot of guys are really strong with guillotines on one side, and not so strong with the other. You're supposed to be strong with both, but in realist, in, you know, in, in realistic terms, not everyone is. He can do it from both sides. He favors the left for sure, but he can do it from both. So then, what actually winds up happening is you can't quite see it here. I'm trying to show you, what ends up happening is. There is a leg entanglement. This inside hook is not doing much. But his right leg, Ben Wynn's right leg, it gets an entanglement that the push allows him to sit. And the entanglement throws off Smolka here. So what happens? You can see there's a leg entanglement right here. And that forces the weight down of Smolka. So he has to address it. So that's actually a little bit of an interesting combo. Now, I don't have a good view of the leg entanglement. The best I can say is that he has one. And you can see that there's only one foot on the ground because one is back here, one is here, and one is entangled, and the other one is dealing with the other portion of that entanglement, trying to like maybe pop it off. Um, the best I can tell you is, but he uses an entanglement to throw off the balance to put the hands down on Smolka. Once the hands go down, the guillotine thread is no longer very sincere, and he's able to get up and move into a better position. And he can go up and then almost take the back here. So, And you can see that leg entanglement right there, which is part of it. That's why you only saw one foot or two feet, essentially, in the last picture. So I can't tell you much more about the leg entanglement, except that he used it a little bit to help him get up. So very, very smart by Ben Wynn here. This is a really back-and-forth fight. Look, we're only 347 into this first fight. Okay, our first round, anyway. And then, of course, he gets the uh, top space. All right? And here we go. So how does... Luis Smoke will get out of it. He does the classic escape, right? If somebody has one side underhook and they don't have the other side underhook, you want to get that side shoulder blades to the mat. Now, what's going to happen inevitably? They're probably, if they're worth a damn, they're going to get to their mount position because you can see there's nothing obstructed. Now, he could have used this hand to push on the knee and then drive his own hand, drive his own knee inside, shrimp out. That's possible too, but in a fight, you know, not everything is going to go technical according to plan. So here is Ben Wynn. And what's Ben Wynn going to do? This is something small, but it has major implications for the kind of grappling you're going to see from Ben Wynn. That. Did you notice what I'm looking at here? It's not merely that he takes mount, but when he takes mount, look at that. He traps the arm at the same time. Let me tell you something. If you don't take this arm and you just take mount, it is going to be very hard to get that choke. The truth about taking mount is you, I, you, know, you're gonna, you should take mount whenever you can get it, really. But the best kinds of mounts are the kind where you can take it and take something with it along the way. An arm, whatever the case may be. Usually, usually it's going to be an arm, obviously. Um, but Or, you know, there's different kinds of chokes that are available to you or, or submissions from mount. When he scoops his hips into place, he blocks that arm with him. Now, Smolka got out of it, but I just want to point out that, like, this is really, this is really good jiu-jitsu. This is somebody who understands... You know, what it means to get to positions, why they're hard to get, why you should do certain things when you get to them. Because if you don't, it's going to be very hard to secure the kind of blessings of the position that would otherwise ordinarily be there. Now, Smolka gets out. Here's another picture of it. And what do you see again? It's that same one we saw from before, that same escape. So what's going to happen? He's going to try and angle his body here. Now, this time, there is no fence. 
There is no fence. This is a dangerous, dangerous way to escape the submission. If he really wanted to, there's an arm bar here. He could, uh, ben Wynn could take his left leg and whip it around and get a triangle. There's a lot of things that could happen here that make this difficult. So you see him pushing on the back of the head here. He wants to keep that posture down. You see Ben Wynn resisting it by pushing his own hand on the mat. Let's see how this goes. He's going to angle more. He's going to bring this body of work around. You see how he's getting at this kind of an angle? Now, here's the interesting part about this. What he's going to do is, this is like, this is just a super risky way to do things. But he's going to use this underhook to force the weight down and onto his shoulder. And he's going to create an angle here. And he's going to roll over and then corkscrew in. So the whole reason he's doing this is because he wants his head to come up first. His head is going to pop up first. And he wants win to be forced down and to a side. As he's going to roll over. Because when he rolls over, he's going to roll over and land on his feet. You'll see. Boom. Boom. He's going to land here. He hasn't quite got all the way around yet. But when this comes down, you see his shoulders are to the mat first? Him. But he can use it to like, he's not stopping here. He's going to go shoulders first and then just keep moving on top. Whereas Wynn is just getting rolled and you see getting blocked. He can't, his whole body's getting turned to his back, right? Like this arm, and he's used the other hand, is holding it here. Because Wynn can't come out and post. So you see Smoka holding the hand here. Pushing down here. Wynn can keep his body erect on one side. So what's Smoker going to do? He's going to go to the side he's blocking. He's going to roll over that way and then corkscrew back on top. One, two. Look at that. When his feet come down, boom. He comes right around. And when he comes right around, he's got the underhook. Now you can see already Wynn going to work. But this is super clever, man. This is, this is the key to Smoker's escapes. He gets an underhook on one side, and he presses the guy's weight forward and down. He uses that to angle his body off to one side. Clears one of the hooks. Well, actually, the hook is still in, but it doesn't have the same kind of effect. He's going to block one whole side, driving your shoulder down, holding the wrist. Turns, comes up, and around. Pretty, pretty nifty. I've actually never seen this taught before. Um, so this is something, obviously, he's gotten quite good at. All right, so now we're on top. There's another Oma Plata sequence, I think, here. And they go through. Same thing you saw before. Here's Ben Wynn with the underhook. And look at Ben Wynn. Look, again, this is like this is about how good Smolka is, but we should not forget how good Ben Wynn is either. Because here's Ben Wynn. Underhook, lifting, and look at this bottom foot. The bottom foot, heel is off the ground, hips off the ground. Bro, that is how you do a sweep. People think it's just extending your leg out or putting an arm underneath. No, 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 no. He's using this leg. He doesn't quite get the extension he wants, but he gets the underhook, he gets the push, and he's going to use that to lift his hips off the ground to get even more of an angle. That's a very technical butterfly um, guard awareness from Ben Wynn. Really good. Now, he gets it kind of. Now, you look at this, you'd say, wow, who's winning in this position? Well, depending on what who you are, it should be Ben Wynn because Ben Wynn – has the the tight waist look that that underhook that Smoka used to turn into him is gone now, right? He has this underhook. He had, you saw the underhook before, but the weight was still kind of on top. See this underhook he has on one. He has two underhooks here, but now he gets thrown forward. He has to plan his weight now. He's got the underhook on essentially at least this side now. Though it doesn't need the underhook on that one. He's sort of controlling the inside space of the bicep. If he can get his head free, he can come out the back. Right, that's why you don't want to do a throw, like a hip throw without an underhook, because if you land on the bottom, you can get your back taken. But here's Smoka, just finding a way to keep position. He's going to do what we saw against Demi and Maya and Gunnar Nelson, the reverse half guard. This is called reverse half guard. Now, what has to happen here is you got to get that, you have to clear that leg, and you got to sit your hips back, and you got to come back on top. But you can lose the position doing that. Like it's very, very difficult to do quickly, especially in MMA. So you're going to see him try that. He's going to sit his hips down and around. He is. Look, I want you to notice something here. He's on his hand, he's on his foot, knee and ass off the ground. Jiu-Jitsu students, knee and ass off the ground. He is on his hand, he is on his foot. Why? Because this gives him hip mobility. Put one hand on the ground and put one foot on the ground and think about how far, if you had someone who's like in shape and, and athletic, how much they can move their hips around. And then sit your ass on the ground and see how much you can move your hips around. This gives him an ability to play essentially twister with Ben Wynn where he can get his hips out and around. He can put hand on yellow, foot on green. Get it? And what he's going to do is he's gonna, you see him holding that leg because he wants to clear his own. 
and he's going to try and get back on top. Here he is trying to pull his own leg out while holding Ben Wins. Because if he holds Wins and pulls it up, he's keeping his hips as flat as he can against the mat. Look at that. Ass off the ground. Now, he can't actually wind up keeping Ben Win down. But this is the key to the wrestling of Luis Smolka. So I mentioned before he likes to put the fight back in positions where, you know, there's a, there's a series of positions where he likes to, to work from. This is one of them. But the key to that is he's not really going to wrestle you down. Now, he does have some good takedowns, Luis Smolka. Luis Smolka. He does have really good takedowns. The difference, though, is that he just makes you go to your back because he will lock up guillotines and darces on you lightning quick, forcing you. You elect to go to your back to get out of him. Here's going to try and sit to mount on a choke, and Ben Wynn has to go to his back and get out of it. Here you see him using a knee shield. I want you to pay attention to how many times Ben Wynn chooses to go to his back to avoid being taken with the guillotine or darts choke. That's how Luis, God damn it, that is how Luis Smolka keeps you down. So here we go again. Ben Wynn, underhook, left side, um, butterfly hook. Can he get the sweep? Let's see. Not quite, but he does roll to deep half. Here he's going to try the Homer Simpson sweep. You essentially roll one way, and then you roll the other, and you come out on top. Here's what he's going to want to try and do. Look at him lifting with the uh, – look at that. This is a good deep half. Now, with a real deep half, you would want this arm tucked underneath. Um, this kind of hurts him a little bit here, but it's MMA. Things happen, right? So here's what he's going to do. He's going to roll one way. He rolled one way. He rolls up, and he's going to roll the other way. He's going to corkscrew his knees uh, to the right. Essentially, so if you're Ben Wynn, you're going to go clockwise. He's going to go clockwise, and what he wants to do is he wants to come up to his base. He wants to bring this hand behind this knee and then drive Smolka down. And that's a takedown. That's a legit or so that's a legit sweep. Homer Simpson sweep, right? That's what he's going to do here. Except when Smolka feels him coming up, whoop, three-quarter stack. And somehow the leg came free here. I'm not exactly sure if Wynn let it go or what happened. This is a three-quarter stack. You can use this to drive someone's head down, and then you can slide a choke into position. You can use a three-quarter stack to put someone on their rear end again. You can drive the head underneath and then kind of push, and they'll fall to their side slash back. Here's the three, but he catches him with a three-quarter stack in transition and then locks this bad boy up. This is what I'm talking about. Now, what's Ben Wynn going to do? Ben Wynn going to stand? Ben Wynn is not going to stand. Ben Wynn is going to elect to go to his back again, forcing him to go to his back. So then he tries to go to mount, tries to finish it. You can see it's not all that tight necessarily, although he's got the arm trapped here. He lets it go. He's going to start banging on him again. He's going to try and hold the position as best he can so he can maybe reapply the choke. And he does. And Ben Wynn gets to his feet. So what's going to happen again? Ben Wynn's going to go to the ground. <laughs> This is what I'm talking about. Every time you think you beat this guy in a scramble, he's not going to try and scramble with you on your terms. All he needs is some kind of head control, and he will put you into this hellish space where you constantly have to acknowledge, you have to respect the choke. You have to respect the choke. So, they keep going. Again, this is another good example of this. He has an underhook on one side. He might be pushing. It's hard to see what Wynn is doing with his left arm, but you see this? Inside hook, blocking forcing the weight up and over. This is not a, a most technical sweep, but it, it'll work. And by the way, what did I mention about the lower side? Look how far his hips are off the ground. Now the knee is down, live toes, ladies and gentlemen. I know, again, this is about Lewis Smolka. Dude, Ben Wynn's jiu-jitsu is good. It's very, very good. It's very technical. It's very thorough. He just happened to catch, get, you know, find a guy who had the kind of game that gave him problems. But that doesn't mean his jiu-jitsu is not good. It's very, very good. And I just want to point out these small details, man. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. These kinds of small details are what gonna make uh, it makes a difference over time and how you get better. Ben Win will get better, and Ben Win will be back. Trust me, I can see it in his game. So it actually forces uh, essentially a cartwheel. He doesn't want to go backwards and fall, so he brings this leg over. This 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 right leg, Smoko brings it out and around. And then he uses that to essentially get out of the leg lock and come back around. And when Ben Wynn tries to stand, what happens? He has to go back down. Again. <laughs> Smoka is just making him pay. Okay? And then he lets go of the choke when he doesn't have it. And then he just hammers you from side control or from half guard. No problem. Doesn't care. Takes him out. Here's Ben Wynn. Look at how far Ben Wynn's hips are off the ground. Pushing on the hips. This is... Um, 
this is technical, but it's like the first half of a few steps. A lot of people make this mistake when they learn how to try to get out of mount. And this is a problem I had to figure out the hard way. If, even if you're me and I'm big, right? So let's say I'm rolling with somebody who's much less strong than me, much, much less big than me. Um, let's say someone who's 170, 180 pounds. You can get a strong guy at 180 pounds, man. You can get people who are really strong. And what I thought I could do was I would just buck like this. I would push like this and they would just fall. Doesn't really work that way. When you buck like this, you, if you're gonna go straight back, you gotta do it to get your. You gotta do it. You have to lift them up, get your knees inside. You have to do it and then slam your hips out to one side. That's one way to do it. But for me, I found the one that really worked was you have to go to your left side and you have to go to your right side. You got a bridge over your left, a bridge over. Your, you have to keep going. A lot of people, and I'm not saying Ben Wynn did this. I'm just sort of saying as a as a, a, a thing to remark about. A lot of people think mount escapes. Or if I just explode to one side, it doesn't work. I'll keep exploding to one side. No, no, no. You have to go side to side. You have to, essentially, once you commit to the idea of I'm going to escape this mount, you have to keep going until you escape it. One big movement, even two big movements is not enough. You have to keep doing it. Um, and Ben Wynn tries to get one here. I just want to point out how, like, how high he's bridging. And Smoke is still just, you know, heels together underneath. Now he kind of falls to his side here. But it's not enough. Smoke braces and comes right back. Ben Wynn still trying to get his legs out. Eventually he does because he kind of rolls to one side. You'll see he comes back and he tries to go. What he's going to do is he's going to try to put this foot um, into like three-quarter mount, which he does successfully, except he's still getting just absolutely banged on. So that he knows that's not enough. So he tries to say, I'm, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to go to my back. And then he rolls through and actually finally gets to half guard. It was only from here You'll see him try to roll through, and then he shrimps out, and then captures uh, half guard here, and then the fight, the, and he gets full guard. So let me just say a point here as the round ends for Ben Wynn. This is an amazing display by Luis Smolka. God damn it, Luis Smolka. But Ben Wynn finished the round capturing full guard. Now maybe Luis Smolka let him do it because he just wasn't really all that concerned about it at this point. But I just want to give credit where credit is due to both guys. All right, so let's take a look at round two here because this is where things just don't really go that well very quickly. Uh, 13 seconds in, you can see here is Lewis Smoka. I think he threw a body kick and a left hook and then dove in on a takedown. So um, you see Ben Wynn try to come around the corner. Smoka tries to hit a switch. They stand. This is my favorite. Now, if I look at this position and I ask you who's winning at this moment in time, you might say Luis, you might say Lewis Smoka. That is not correct. It's Ben Wynn, and you'll see why as they as they scramble through. Look at that. It's easy. If you want to use someone's leg to to, to take them down or to, to win a scramble or something, you maybe could have used a trip here. Maybe you could have done a trip, and they would have gone down because you have the leg. But the leg is a really strong muscle, and unless, unless you get your weight really on top of it, which he does not have here. When I say on top of it, I mean like the, you know, you, you need to have this knee by your hip on top of it. Um, you're not really going to win. And so here comes Ben Wynn. And you can see he's going to be ready to take the back here like a hook. This is what I love about Lewis Smolka. Watch this turn. And we saw these. he does these turns before, these like rolls through. He loves to roll through and get into positions backwards. And I think a lot of guys are not used to that, right? So he rolls through. Look what he does here. He actually, from here, he's going to roll over his left shoulder, right? He's not going to roll straight over his back. It's more of a shoulder roll. And he comes out. He's going to plant this hand, and you see him holding on to Ben Wynn's hand. Now, he's holding the hook in place. Now, why is he holding the hook in place? One, he wanted it sort of a, something secure to roll through with. But I think it's more than that. I actually think that when he rolled through like this, what he wanted to do was secure this to help him come up. He didn't want to get stuck flat on the uh, or too close to Ben Wynn. He didn't want to get stuck, um, you know, not making enough of a turn through. This is a hunch. I can't be for sure about this because this is not something I ever do. I think he held on to the ankle here so that he could come up. You can see Ben Wynn trying to hold him here. So when he rolls through, he has he has something to brace on that allows him to fully roll through to the top so he can sit his hips up and around. That's why I think he did that. He lets go of the hook once he, get, he sits up. Here he lets go of it. He doesn't need it anymore. Now he's got his own hand planted here. And he's got his hips driven out. He's got that reverse half guard, I think, again, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's going to have that, well, sort of reverse half guard. Yeah, more or less, except he can just come around. And then he takes his arm out and stuffs it. Now, you could say Ben Wynn should have held this on here. He's kind of posted on an elbow. But at this point, he's probably beat up and tired. And he's not, 
it's hard to like if you know what I'm if I know what you're gonna do I can maybe stop it but it's it, Smolka comes to these positions in a, in a very unorthodox ways so he comes and then now he's on top and he pushes down so Louis Smolka Louis Smolka I'm gonna call him Louis the rest of my life and I don't know what's wrong with me all right so here we go again Ben Wynn escapes gets climbs back to the fence stands up or tries to stand up what's Smolka gonna do he's gonna lock the head. He's going to sit deep on this high elbow guillotine here. Look, I mean, Jesus, that is, you got someone dead to rights when you're doing that. So what is Ben Wynn going to do? He's going to go to his back again, forcing him again. And Smoka posts on his head to go to side control. Love that. That must have hurt a little bit, but it's uh, real smart, very smart. So he goes to side control here, and then eventually he gets out of it. He goes on a takedown again. And then when he does, he moves right to, uh, this is sort of Jacare-esque, where you can take someone down and then immediately slide your hips in. You can see how wide he can get his base. Now, Ben Wynn is going to turn, I believe, to his left here. Yep. And you can see him going to get up. But that's fine. Smoker doesn't mind giving it up. He'd rather keep the position, but if you're going to get up, he's going to make you pay. This is where he bombed on him with a couple of knees to the body as well, which is kind of sick. He finally stands. He goes back. He runs the pipe. And you see Ben Wynn. I mean, this is, this is when things turned real, real bad for him. Okay, and you can see his body language is now finally beginning to change. Um, he's covering up. Let's he lets him stand. He dives in on the takedown. You can see Ben Wynn is trying to get out and around to stuff the shot, and he even gets a, an underhook here. You can see the underhook he gets, but he's so tired at this point that Smoka just cut, cuts the corner, comes around, and stuffs him and lays him flat. Look at the spinal flexion here. You normally don't want to see that in a takedown, but it works for for Smoka. So um, let him run with it. Ben Wynn tries to stand. What happens when he tries to stand? He makes him go right back down. Now, this is that Pedro Munoz guillotine style. He's got the arm through. You can see the ear and the neck, so it's not necessarily all that tight, but he tries to get that right leg through and over and around. You can see that Ben Wynn puts a elbow down to block it a little bit, um, which prevents him from getting just absolutely murdered by this guillotine, and he's even pushing off the fence to drive the weight down for that to work. Kind of like... The presence of mind to do that after you've taken this much of a beating is pretty incredible, okay? So Ben Wynn is a beast. Let it be known. Now, finally, uh, Smoker lets it go, tries to lock up a triangle with the arm he has trapped. doesn't really work. And uh, you see uh, what, what happens is that Smoker tries to lock it up here. Wynn is going to come around the corner. Trying to come around the corner like this to stuff a triangle, you see it happen all the time. You better be super careful about doing it. Um... Well, let's, you know, you can come, okay, if it's loose, you can come around this side, and you can see he drives that knee uh, over and around. Smolka basically is like, okay, I don't have the triangle anymore, I'm going to come around the top, and I'm going to, he's, what he's going to do is he's going to scoot himself up, so he's sitting up, essentially facing, and then he's going to turn uh, his body almost 180, like that, coming out and around. He's going to do essentially a 180 and come back on top. Now, Ben Wynn thinks, oh, he went too far. He doesn't have the underhook. How many times have we seen Luis Smoko do this? So what does Smoko do? He does the right thing. A lot of guys might try to stand and then fight it. What I like about Smoka is that he always puts weight back into wherever the attack is coming from. So rather than trying to stand and get away, he turns back into it. And when he does, when he turns back into it, he also wraps the head. Whenever he does these weird turns like this, where he's like you don't even see him have a wizard here. He may have a wizard later. He's going to sit out and come back and around, which is going to put Wynn flat against the fence like you see this. And he's going to go again and grab for that choke again. Guess what's going to happen here, folks? I think you know the answer. That's a terrible position for Ben Wynn, by the way. He's going to go flatten every time. Every time he makes you do it. Even if he doesn't get the choke, he makes you respect it. So he goes to Mount. And by the way, what he wound up doing was he sits here. And then what he winds up doing is he winds up kicking the legs out and rolling through onto Mount. And it, it gives it up, but, like, you know, um, does it on purpose, right? Like, sort of takes win to Mount in this particular case because I think he felt like he had a better shot there. Look at this choke. Look how deep this choke is. I mean, <laughs> how Ben Wynn didn't tap to this, I'll never know. Completely underneath the chin, head hand behind the head. Wynn isn't even fighting the high hand. He eventually does. And then he switches, uh, Smoka switches to a gable grip. But you can see he's kind of off to the side. He's not quite underneath. 
So this it's just not enough for someone who's as tough as Ben Wynn. Decides to give it up, goes to mount, or I'm sorry, a back mount. He then rolls to mount, and here he is, you know, just taking turns, flattening him, either with positional control or with punches, you know, Nate Diaz, Conor McGregor style. Uh, and then I think if this is the first elbow that sets it up, and that's the elbow that essentially got Herb Dean to say, I've seen enough. And then there you go. That's it. So let's recap this real quickly. Number one, never seen a guy take this kind of a beating and still keep like doing things. Like Ben Wynn was still moving. I think the referee just said this is a mercy stoppage, one that I'm entirely okay with. That's the first thing, too. You know, Ben Wynn lost here, but you, you need to see those finer technical details. He was really making Luis Smolka work for it. I think he'll be back, and I think he'll be a really great fighter going forward. Luis Smolka. He has very unorthodox, frankly risky transitions, but he's able to make them work. And what he does with them is he gets into positions backwards. He goes into force, not away from it. Um, he has unorthodox entries into scrambles. But more than that, he brings the fight back to scenarios where he already has a really strong existing skill set. And he doesn't try to scramble with wrestlers. He makes wrestlers give up the scramble before it ever really gets going with his constant head and arm attacks. Luis Smolka is a gangster. All right, and last but not least, we always talk about what's coming up in the week ahead. Two big cards to look out for. Number one, UFC on Fox 20, and then, of course, Bellator 159. So what are the fights to pay attention to on those cards? In my judgment, if we're looking at Bellator 159, which, of course, is going to be on Friday night, Darian Caldwell versus Joe Timonglow. Now, I don't... Look, Joe Tommy was a good fighter, but Derek Caldwell is potentially going to be a very elite fighter. He's the bigger, not name necessarily, although he is that too, but this is a guy who's a top prospect. You know, Tommy Glow's a tough fight, but this is one of those tests for one of these blue chip prospects as they come up through the ranks. Good to see him headlining a card as well, although I like to see him on bigger cards and bigger fights, but you get the idea. Melvin Gallard is back. Not a lot of fanfare for him taking on David Rickles. Um, and then, of course, Daniel Weichel versus Emmanuel Sanchez. Emmanuel Sanchez was one of the bright spots from Bellator 149, uh, despite everything else that went on. So a lot to like with him there. Um, okay, and if we're looking at UFC on Fox 20, this is a little bit of a different card. Um, it's it's okay, it's not great. The big one, of course, Holly Holm taking on Valentino Shevchenko. That should be very, very interesting. Um, tough fight for Holm, and if Holm loses this, man, you're going to have Shevchenko versus uh, Nunez. That is going to be very, very difficult for that division to uh, make use of its star power in those particular circumstances. It's in Barboza returns against Gilbert Melendez. I always mispronounce his name. Francois Nganou returns uh, against, I believe... I'm not even going to pronounce his last first name, but Mihal Mihalovic, something like that. Uh, Felix Herrig taking on, taking on Caleb Curran. Eddie Wineland is back against Frankie Sines. Uh, Godofredo Pepe is going to take on Darren Elkins. Um, Kamaru Usman is, of course, back in action. The Cowboy, Alex Oliveira against James Moon. Tossery is kind of fun. And then uh, it's really about it in terms of what's on my radar. So those are your big two. Keep an eye out for those. We'll take a look at those. And, of course, there's going to be more technical action uh, broken down for you guys in this podcast and in subsequent ones as well. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, email me, luke.thomas at espionation.com. Appreciate that. Any corrections as well, same thing. Please correct me if I get something wrong. I always appreciate the help. Until next time, guys, thank you for watching. Enjoy the fights.